I would like to just acknowledge uh, from the first panel the import of the comment that Catherine made about, you know, the, the fact that, yeah, at least in, in the industry of film and television, you know, so much of the work flies sort of under our understanding of labor laws and standards. Well, you know, musicians live that, that sort of lack of any, you know, sort of lack of any standards lack of any rules around how we're treated, uh, lack of any uh, regulations around health and safety standards. So in other words, well, if it's going to take you 12 hours to drive to that gig through a snowstorm to get there, you kind of got to do it. Um, and so what I find really exciting about being part of this conversation here today is that I think that it, it represents uh, a greater understanding of, you know, who are workers in our society. I mean, there's no bylaws and standards regulating a rock and roll band. And by and large, that's been probably a problem. And so today what we're going to do here is talk a little bit about how the value gap, you know, and I mean artists have lived this value gap since before, uh, you know, the fax machine, um, but how it plays out today. Uh, and, and just, you know, I think it's also fair to say, uh, safe to say here, you know, as I, and I know so many of you over the years, you know, that, that, that this business, you know, there's easier ways to make a living <laughs> than in music, right? Like there, there's easy, you, you all had choices, you know, we all had choices, right? I think about that every morning. Yeah, no doubt you do, no doubt you do. But one of the reasons that uh, we're all here is because we love music and we want music to happen. And it can't happen unless artists can make a decent living and be healthy and happy in their lives. And that's by and large why we're here today. So maybe, uh, you know, I'm just gonna throw it open to the two of you, you've had like these, you know, and forgive the gender language here, but you are both Renaissance men, women, <laughs> both Renaissance women. You do it, you're jacks of all trades, um, and Jill's. that Jill's of all trades, sorry, this is gonna really <laughs> be problematic today, but I'm, okay. I'm up for the challenge, I'm up go. for it, I'm up for and it. And you wear and many I, hats and, well. I, and, I, and I welcome it too, and it's about bloody time. Okay. How do you make a living here? How do you make a living today? Good question. And before we get to that, I just want to say how refreshing the panel previous yeah. to this was to have mm -hmm. these discussions actually out in the open. This is, these are things that we talk about uh, you know, over, over um, wine you know, uh, to sort of make ourselves feel better at the end of the day, or, or especially both of us who've been on tour buses with mainly men and for the majority of our careers. So uh, all of these discussions are incredible and it's so great that we're at least talking about it and taking firm action. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to just make one point because Jackie brought up the, uh, the childcare yeah. issue. And I know this is something that's very dear to your heart mm -hmm. and uh, I don't want to take the time of the value gap, which is also very, very important. But this is actually a time in Toronto's history and Canada's history when we could make visionary and historic changes. Um, the company Patagonia, which is an out, outdoor wear company, they started a childcare in their building. Uh, and it has become uh, self-sustaining as well as um, it has had uh, employee retention, um, greater employee loyalty, uh, obviously giving women and men an opportunity to have childcare. And I know that uh, the Liberty Village area is now turning into a bit of a music hub. We've got Universal moving in uh, with a new blueprint and uh, Karis, I believe, Music Canada is there. But this could actually be a time when a daycare option was discussed and, and brought forward and implemented because it could be a really, really strong move towards helping women and helping uh, the industry. It's a, an amazing point. I mean, just to shake everybody off, we're poor, y'all. We've been poor for a long time. This is not new to us. It's new to the industry because um, musicians technically and for a very long time 
have been undervalued. As recently as in the last couple of months, I went to play an event uh, with a, a record label that is known for having a lot of money. They paid the caterer, they paid the videographer, they paid the band, they paid for very high-end vodka. The only people that were not getting paid were the artists. This is something, you know, the, the only good thing that has happened with Trump is that people are angry now and are, and are not afraid to, you know, voice their anger. It just made me angry. Why would I spend $120 to get a babysitter to come down here to play for your company, not Warner, obviously, I can, and that, <laughs> or, or anybody here that I love and, and I've been so supportive, supported as an artist throughout my career, um, but why would I do that? Pay a babysitter, get an Uber, because time is money. If, if I'm not going to get an Uber, I'm going to pay a babysitter. Why would I do that? Why am I so undervalued that my name would be on the invite? That you can't think of paying me as an artist because I already have money? Absolutely not true. What I did today, I sang on a television show, which I will only get paid for once, the same with your situation with the public of Doyle, um, about a pony who babysits. It's going to be a smash hit. Probably a smash hit. It sounds like a smash hit. I'm singing all the, all the songs in the show and I'm singing, the, I'm getting paid a ridiculously small amount of money, but I'm doing it because where else am I going to make money? You know, and, and that goes into, in terms of the sound recording that we should be paid for that. Like everybody else is paid. Why? You know, there's going to be nobody good left. You know, there's going to be nobody good left and you're going to be stuck listening to shitty music because only shitty people can afford to make it. <laughs> All right, I think that wraps up this uh, panel today, folks. Yeah, sorry. Mic drop. Sorry. Maybe just uh, quickly just give us uh, just a, a bit of a list of, of the ways in which you do uh, make a living because I think there, and I, I don't, I'm not saying that this crew thinks this, but there's a general misconception that musicians roll out of bed at, at you know, 3.30 in the afternoon, uh, you know, drink some Jack Daniels and, you know, I don't know what they do, and then it they uh, make awesome. a record or whatever, yeah. right? You know, uh, give us a sense of what it actually means to be a working musician in this I country right now. I think it's right just now. wearing so many hats, and, and I find my days are taken up with so much administration, um, and, and not enough time to write, and not enough time to, to have that, those, those moments that I actually am inspired by. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm updating my Facebook, and I'm doing my Spotify work, trying to get, I'm selling their product, basically, through my music, and trying to get people to subscribe to Spotify so that I can get paid 0.004 extra cents per stream, because if they do subscribe, there is a difference than just ad-based services. Um, you know, I'm uploading things on Twitter and SoundCloud, and I mean, it just, it just, the list is so long as to what you have to do. And I'm so glad I spent so much time on my MySpace page, yeah. because that was really great. <laughs> you know, these, the turnover is huge, so I mean, how, how much can we invest in each new techno technological, um, you know, uh, Silicon Valley uh, mm -hmm. product mm -hmm. that we have to now invest in and sell to our fans. And there's fan fatigue too. I mean, people are, are, are ta they are, they're so overexposed. I mean, you, you turn on Netflix now and how many Netflix things come up that are Netflix produced that are getting ahead of all of the stuff that is actually just being made because of passion and love and not algorithms, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Am I missing anything? Uh, no, I, uh, maybe just go to all of the other things that you do. I mean, you play with other bands, you tour overseas, you... Yeah, to make a living, I have been a side musician for a really long time, and, um, and I almost regret that decision because I didn't have any creative stake in the game, no skin in the game, or if I did, I didn't know enough to demand it. So even though that's a lot of my intellectual property on a lot of those records that I've played on, um, it's interesting, after the uh, Economic Club speech, um, I had a criticism from um, a professor in uh, Ottawa, and it was a really interesting one because he said, um, <laughs> hmm, I wonder who that is, and he said, uh, he said well, you know, it, it, you, you wouldn't have made any money on YouTube anyway because your music doesn't get a lot of hits. And I thought, well, okay, um, but I did play on, you know, over 50 other albums that do have millions and millions and millions of hits, and I don't get paid for that either. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can, mm -hmm. that, you know, that's another sort of issue. Thank you for bringing that up, because 
uh, professor, mm -hmm. because that's another problem with the, the YouTube is that there aren't any um, neighboring rights mm -hmm. that go to any of the people who did help out on those things. But yeah, I do play um, side as a side musician as well as create my own music. I started a music festival. I employed uh, 23 bands this summer at my music festival because um, I think it's really important to to create opportunities for other musicians who are doing things that you believe in. I have a record label that doesn't make any money either. So, um, but again, I just I believe so much in this idea of. Um, of collaboration and bringing people together and actually trying to foster something and create something. But this is all on my dime. So yeah, mm -hmm. wait, wait, how do I make mm -hmm. money? Good mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. Well, I do a lot of theater. That makes a ton of dough here in Canada. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how, how about you? So you're buying dinner tonight. I get yeah. it. McDonald's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, and you, you. Well, a, uh, in a the last bunch of records. Yeah, I've, I mean, I've been a recording artist for a very long time, but in the last four years, I've had two kids. During which point, um, I, I'm, I don't want to get this wrong, but I think it was. Oh, I can't remember what music union it was informed me that because I had not had a, a recent contract come through there, that my pension was I could not access my pension. Like it was, it had been such a long time because I have been having babies, I, you know, that I can't access it now because I've, I'm, uh, until I'm 65, something maybe I would have wanted to do that. Um, but I've been having children along the way I, you know, write songs, which used to be a way more lucrative situation than it is now. I think if I remember from the value gap, it's fallen down 27% writers are paid 27% less than they were, you know, 15, 20 years ago. But I do voiceovers when I can get it. But I mean, as an artist, I mean, if you get into a van, if your favorite band is getting into a van and they're going across the country for three or four weeks and they come home and they don't owe thousands of dollars, then that is a victory, that is, that is a success. So for me to go on the road, not only does it cost me the amount of money for hotel rooms, for flights, for travel, it costs me thousands of dollars in babysitting because I am not, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing there for, you know, so it costs me an incredible amount of money to go out on the road, which, and to earn money, which now is kind of the only allotted place that artists earn money. It's like, well, you're not making money off the radio, you're not making money off publishing, you're not making money off records, the only place you're gonna make money is playing live. If I play a show at the Dakota, that's gonna personally cost me $700, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's bleak, it's, you know, but this has been the situation for us forever, so it's not new. There's, I mean, I remember when one of my first records came out, I had incredible support from EMI, they were fantastic, they spent a shitload of money on me, I had this incredible CD release party, and uh, I had a sponsorship from Winches and Rogues on college, so they gave me my clothes, but I went barefoot, because I did not have money to buy shoes, and that was, 17 years ago, and nothing has changed for us. Nothing has changed. I mean, I am so lucky to own a house. I own a house because my husband used to work in the music industry, and he bought a house. Thank you for doing that, Greg, because, you know, now we're self-employed. Greg owns a restaurant. He employs more artists than probably anybody in this room because everybody who's off the road goes to the Ace and gets a job and Greg because he knows the music industry he knows what it's like to have the life of an artist and he lets people go on tours for three for three weeks here and there and come back and the shifts are there um, so it's 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 bleak but it's been bleak for a long time well one of the promises uh, that that the internet um, uh, presented back in the day was was an ability for um, you know for niche artists uh, to f to find an audience, right? That this was the this was the the theory of the long tail, right? And 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 it, and it did promise sort of like the development of a middle class of artists, which is I think what what we need here in this country and a, and a, and a, for the arts in general. So that is something that was different, that has been different. And I, I'm just wondering if both of you were excited by that possibility at one time and, and how that's actually lived out for you in your, in your careers. Well, my first band that I had on my own was a, a jazz cabaret band. So you can, that's pretty niche. And, um, and you know, and, and so 
that was a very attractive thing. Mm -hmm. and, and in the early days of MySpace, and when I started playing, it, you did find people who really liked what you did. Um, there is a problem now with the streaming services and algorithms. And I just wrote a blog about this for SoCan, which, um, interesting enough, had a very interesting um, criticism as well from somebody who uh, I think is quite key, <laughs> literally. Um, but the algorithms, it's almost like Ouroboros. So if you are a niche artist and you are, the way that they work, you're on the fringes anyway. Uh, and then so you don't come up as, as quite as often into the cycle if people are discovering. And the less you come out, the less you come up, and the less you come up. And so then by that time, you've been streamed, you know, 10 times a year. Um, mm -hmm. And so that niche, that niche argument doesn't work anymore because it doesn't actually aid uh, the smaller artists. It actually only aids artists that are, are sort of more in that um, mainstream genre. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because I, I used, uh, I did criticize, you know, algorithms and um, the first criticism that came up on my blog was from um, uh, Director of Policy and Government Relations at Google Canada. Uh -huh. and, I, and I thought that was a really interesting move because um, this was really just a, a blog about creativity um, and it was just sort of a very aggressive <laughs> Um, move from Google. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, that's it. I mean, you know, if you think that artists who aren't selling, hi, don't wake up in the morning going, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? What, what is the value for me? What is the value for anybody else? But essentially, if you're an artist that doesn't have self-doubt, then really what kind of an artist are you? Once you get to your 10,000 hours, when you're really good, and you're still in a van and you can't afford to do it anymore, you're actually depriving yourselves of the really good artists. Like, you know, Leonard Cohen went to Hydra and took an incredible amount of drugs and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote, and wrote based on grants from Canada for his novel writing. We're really, really fortunate in this country to have things like Factor and to have things like Slate Music who support our artists. We are in, in that one sense, we are in, very, in a very rarefied earth up in Canada, up here in Canada, that we do have an industry that supports us. It supports us in the creation of the art itself, but there it falls off. We want a, a sustainable marketplace. It's a sustain, yes. That's what we really yeah. require. I Nobody that, wants to spend 55 hours doing a factor application three, every three. Nobody wants that. It is tedious. It is the death of creativity. But thank God they are there to facilitate this work. Pretty much every, it would be an artist's dream to not have to apply for factor. This, you know, that would be a great milestone. But as soon as the record's made, I mean, the artists don't make any money. You, you know, babysitting's not taken care of. There's, the, the product is made. And then the support, you know, where, how do we continue to create art? It's, it's impossible in this landscape. Mm -hmm. So you think we, we, you think it's possible for us to have a different kind of conversation about, about the role of, uh, of, of the artists in, Canadian society, I mean, are you saying that we should be increasing factor so more of us can go to uh, the Greek islands and, and do drugs? <laughs> Sounds awesome. <laughs> I'm the just anticipating, I, I'm, I, I'm just hearing the, you know, the other side of the argument here. So, granting is so great. What, what do we want to talk about? What do we want to say about granting this? Granting is great, and it's, it's amazing that we have those, those yeah. capabilities in Canada. But it, it, that is not, what we want is a sustainable working marketplace where we are creating art and we are being remunerated for it properly. And that is just, that is not happening for a variety of reasons. And one, I believe, it, it, obviously policy must change. Yeah. The government needs to make some pretty swift cuts mm -hmm. uh, to, um, to end some of these subsidies. Um, and that's a big deal. Uh, and, and I love that people are actually having this conversation now and, and asking about what our lives look like. Um, it, that it isn't flashy parties, you know, and, and being honest, being more honest on Instagram and Facebook about what touring actually looks like because it doesn't look the way that, uh, that I think most people picture it. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the sustainable marketplace question is very key and whether that means, you know, reaching out to Spotify to uh, like trying to get more um, ad uh, less ad-based and more subscriber, obviously that's that's this is where we're going, we're going to a streaming universe, so we need to really focus on trying to get as many people uh, signed up so that the 
you do get those extra point zero zero four cents mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. um, on your. But I mean, this is definitely something that that we we desire because it doesn't feel good to rely on grants. It, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel like you're doing anything worthwhile. Yet at the same time, people love your stuff. You have these amazing one-on-one -on -one interactions with people whose lives have been changed by music and your music. And so those things don't equate. And it's it's very difficult and discouraging uh, to continue. Mm -hmm. So in the, within the context of the conversation around the disparity between uh, you know the amount of consumption of music uh, via user-generated content sites uh, and the value that gets transferred back to artists, labels, uh, the industry in general. Um, how do you see a change like that affecting Canadian artists? How do you, how do you see an improvement in that equation uh, trickling to, to the actual artists? So in other words, if there's a gap there, which Graham's just laid out, uh, and what we, what we really want to talk about is how this is going to affect artists, you know. Is there, I mean, a, is there an argument, for example, if there were government officials here right now, um, you know, what would you say to them about the importance of, of, of changing that, those, you know, that equation? In, in other words, enforcing uh, a different kind of copyright regime on sites like, like YouTube. Um, do you feel like that type of change is going to greatly enhance or change the game for, for artists? I think Canada? it certainly would. Yeah. I think um, if we take a look just over to other countries, if you look at France, uh, who's taken some very strong um, opinions, they have very strong opinions about Spotify and about, and about a lot of the streaming services, and they've taken some really harsh stances. And I feel as though our government is still in a lot of conversations and they're, they're being very polite. Yeah. Um, with a lot of these giant tech companies where there actually could be some pretty significant, mm -hmm. um, maybe further than conversations, but actually drawing a line in the sand. Mm -hmm. And that would be appreciated by us, and that would definitely change mm -hmm. our livelihoods. Yes, for sure. I mean, it, it is, it's, when you lay it out like this, um, it's, it's highway robbery. It's basically everybody's. Well, this is this is where the train is going. If you if you want any exposure, then I mean, to hold out on Spotify and YouTube in this era would be absolutely ridiculous. You just shoot yourself in the foot. But it's like, oh, everybody else is doing it, and oh, well, they're doing it for free too. Okay, well, let's. We have no choice. I mean, it's it's the fact that the government has not changed or amended this legislation is since I was seventeen. Laughable. You know, it's laughable. I mean, someone made a mistake, and then no one's willing to clean up the mess. It is a mistake. It's a mistake. It's a mistake. And it's so, a mistake. And so Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> All right. And so finally, just as, as we wrap up and, and uh, with the, you know, thinking about our first panel, which talked a lot about, about governance and, uh, and the need for, for parity, gender parity, uh, maybe you, you could close by just, you know, just giving us a sense of in your, you know, you've both been performers, writers, uh, you know, strong voices in the Canadian music scene. Um, you know, just what's it like to be a woman in this business in, in Canada? This is not a five hour long panel. Yeah, yeah. I know that. I know that. Yeah. But you're here. We've been having this conversation about, about governance, corporate, nonprofit. But we, ne we almost never talk about this in, the, in, in terms of the actual artists themselves and, and how this gets played out. I think it's a, it's a great conversation that we are now having. It's great. I mean, I have been absolutely consumed by the news and social media in the last week and a half since the Weinstein thing happened because as a female in the industry, at a very young age, at 16 or 17, I turned off that switch. I turned off that switch where I had to bro down. That was it. It was like my, what I thought of myself. I remember doing my first recording and there was, I had literally just come off the boat from a Catholic school in Newfoundland. And there was, not a boat, but I was fresh off the boat. And there was a Playboy magazine in the bathroom and I was absolutely horrified. I just couldn't believe it. And then 
uh, you know, there was discussion about it, and um, I changed in that moment. I realized anything I thought was off limits as a woman, if I'm going to do this and succeed at it, I have to turn that off. And the things that have happened to me and to my friends that you shake off, like not having a Playboy magazine, I mean, real things that have happened to me. If I'm the only person, only female on the road with 12 or 13 men. I have shut it out. I have put it to the back of my head. And to have these floodgates open has been fantastic. And it's very emotional. And now I'm remembering these things that have happened that at the moment, well, you know what, I'll just have a couple drinks and it'll be fine when you're on the road because you have to get through it. There's just not that infrastructure there to combat it. And now it's, it feels great. It feels amazing. This week feels amazing, doesn't it? The transparency's been incredible. The transparency, it's amazing. And it was hard, you know, you, you, you saw so many Me Too hashtags on everybody's social media and it going through in my head all the times and I thought, yeah, me too, but so many more times and they would yeah. keep flashing back yeah. all these inappropriate things and things that had happened and I'd even I even went to somebody in our industry and, and I complained about something really recently and uh, and I got the oh that's just so and so and I thought you know that's yeah. not good enough anymore yeah. and the transparency uh, would think across the board I think it's really important transparency in Spotify and what people are actually making, very important transparency in how we're being treated uh, as artists driving 12 hours in the, to get to Saskatoon, uh, and transparency in how women are being treated. It's very important to have these conversations. Feels good. All right, well, thank you both for taking the thank time you. out of your busy schedules to thank be you. here today. Okay. <laughs>